Good morning. If you can open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is week 14 and the final week in our series in 1 Corinthians, a journey that we started on January 8th. I feel grateful to be finishing at 1 Corinthians. I don't know about you. Um, yeah, thank you for the applause. I don't know how to take that, but it's been a journey, right? It's been a longish journey. Uh, actually, there's a lot more that could be said on 1 Corinthians. We've covered content from almost every chapter. We haven't gone like super in depth on everything that's there. And some of you are probably like, hey, there's some things you're not, you're missing here, John. True. Okay, so if you want some more content on, or some resources on that, um, just email me, john, j-o-n, hope to you.com, and I'll get those over to you. Um, no better chapter to end on than for, uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, this chapter uh, contains a portion that is often quoted as well known in the Christian world and outside, actually. And so let's, uh, let me pray, and then we'll read uh, 1 Corinthians 13 in its entirety, and then we'll get into it. God, we just want to thank you for your love for us. What we've sang about it this morning, many of us have experienced it firsthand. Um, some haven't, who are probably listening today. And God, we want to pray for them, that you should open their hearts, God, so they could see how great your love is for them and what you've done for them. So Lord, would you fill our hearts by your spirit this morning and would you help us to understand who you are, what you've done for us, and what you're calling us to, Lord, through your word. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So here we go, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, this very well-known, very famous uh, portion of scripture. Here we go. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, Paul says, I, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. They had like bronze mirrors, not a clear re uh, reflection like we have today. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I, I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Uh, there's three, uh, this chapter, I sorry, could be divided, I think, kind of neatly into three sections. This is one of those chapters that preachers love, like, oh, thanks for laying it out for me. It's nice and crisp. But here's the three sections. Uh, first one's the superiority of love. The second one is the definition of love. And the third one is the future of love. So let's take a look at those uh, one at a time. First one, the, superior, the superiority of love. It's interesting that 1 Corinthians 13 follows 1 Corinthians 12. So this great chapter on love follows this great chapter on the spiritual gifts. It's not the only place that Paul does this. If you look at Ephesians chapter 4 and if you look at Romans chapter 12, those of you who know your Bibles, these are, uh, they contain passages and, and teaching on spiritual gifts in the church. They are also, each one of these, followed by a teaching on love. So why is that? Why does Paul follow this teaching on spiritual gifts with this teaching on love? Every time it happens. 
Uh, Brandon, he preached last week. Thank you, Brandon. If you didn't hear his message, I encourage you to go to hopetoyou.com and listen to it. The guy has a heart of gold and reminded us of some really important truths uh, from 1 Corinthians 12. But he hinted at this last week. He said, listen, this chapter ends with this in, in chapter 12. After talking about these spiritual gifts, uh, Paul says, and yet I will show you the most excellent way after all this, and that is, of course, the way of love. See, in this church in Corinth, there is a big focus on spiritual gifts, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, Paul encourages the church to discover their spiritual gifts and to use them for building up the church. That's a good thing. We should actually pursue that more. We should look and see what has God given me that I can share with others. Uh, It's good for people to, believers, to discover that. And every single believer, if you're a follower of Jesus today, you have a spiritual gift. But there seems to be like this problem or a threat, I guess, that comes along with gifts. And maybe some of you have experienced that in your own life. Whenever there's gifts, there's also the potential for things like jealousy or maybe the misuse of that gift. I don't know if we, I've, I remember when I was a kid, I remember my brother, my older brother, getting like Optimus Prime Transformer, and I was like, looked at my gift and I was like so mad because it wasn't that. You know what I'm talking about? Like there's always this potential when something good is given that there's jealousy or there's anger or there's like this, um, you know, misuse of that gift. And Brandon talked about his, you know, child having a, a fire truck axe and misusing it, right, and hitting his sister with it. That can happen. Um, I wonder if anyone can think of other examples where things that are intended for good that God gives people that are actually used in ways that were not intended. Uh, there's in this church in Corinth, there's lots of examples that Paul gives. Leadership, which was meant to build up the church and to lead the church. Well, people in the church are being divided over leaders, saying like, oh, we follow this leader, we follow that one, we follow this leader here, and it's actually dividing the church. The very thing that was meant to build the church up together, these leaders, was actually the people were being divided over it. Um, Communion, the very essence of communion is to come together around what Christ has done for us. Like, it is the most unifying thing that Christians do is communion. And yet this communion meal was causing division in the church. Like the, the very thing that was, co- uh, was designed to bring about unity was actually causing division. And, and I was thinking about this in my modern day context. I have on my list here a few things. I just, like, I just crossed them out because I don't want to talk about it. But there are things today that God has given the church which are meant to unify, which at times cause division. So this church in Corinth was quite comfortable with expressing their spiritual gifts and Paul reminds them here, look at this, uh, in verse 1. If I, if I speak in the tongues of, of men, or of angels, sorry, but don't have love, I'm only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, I have the faith to move mountains, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess, the poor, my body to hardship, I may boast, but I don't have love, I gain Nothing. So it seems like in this church in Corinth that there is a people being elevated for different reasons in the church. Uh, people who maybe had this ability to speak well, gifted communicators, um, things like this. And I just got to say, like, I think there's a real danger um, and potential threat in Western Christianity as well. And it's the celebrity culture that we find in, in Christianity. You know what I'm talking about? It's just like, I don't think it's that person, that's necessarily those speakers' fault that they become celebrity status, but like it's just kind of dangerous. Um, gifted musicians, gifted artists, um, even those that like sacrifice a lot, right? We're like, wow, those people are amazing. And we, we elevate like people we call saints and things like that. They've given so much of their life and we elevate these individual people. And that, it's not like necessarily wrong, but there's also potential danger to it, and there definitely is a celebrity culture in Christianity. And Paul says, listen, um, even if these people do all these great things, if, if they don't have love, listen, they're nothing. They're absolutely nothing, and they gain nothing. And so we've got to be careful who we elevate. Uh, look at the, Paul, the examples that Paul gives. Listen, it, he says, if someone speaks in the tongues of angels, if someone uh, prophesies in such a way that it's actually accurate, like they say this is going to happen and it happens, like they have the gift of prophecy, if they can get this, if they can fathom all mysteries or all knowledge, like there's people in our midst who just seem to have this like wisdom or this like knowledge of things they can see like around the corner. You know what I mean? 
Imagine if you, if you could fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. If someone has a faith that can move mountains, like literally they have so much faith, they speak into situations and, and things change. If someone gives all they possess to the poor, I mean, if someone did that, we'd probably elevate them. We're like, wow, that person is like really sacrificial. Um, and even if someone surrenders their body over to hardship, the original actually, it, it talks about being burned or burned in the flames meaning like martyrdom by fire. Like that person has faith. Wow, like they are committed. They just like were killed by fire for their faith. If someone has all these things, Paul's saying, the Bible's saying, it's like, listen, if, if they don't have love, it counts for nothing. Like we got to just pause and take that in. Seriously, how often do we think about these things as the most important things and, and Scripture comes along and says, actually, like as important those things are and as good as those things are, actually what matters is love more than anything else. And what I've found is that oftentimes love, those who love most, they do these acts of love behind the scenes. And they're not going to be elevated. They're not going to uh, have a spotlight on them. And it's these people who love the most who are going to be elevated one day. I think we're going to be surprised one day when we see not only the people in heaven, but the, the way that they're elevated. And I think it's going to be a lot of the people that weren't where I am on stage. It's going to be the people behind the scenes. They didn't know their names, but they just committed their lives to loving people. And like I know some of you, I interact with some of you, and sometimes I get this like little thought in my head like, John, be careful how you treat this person because they're going to have the house on the hill in heaven, not you. So just be kind to them. Because some of you are just like, I see you at times doing things behind the scenes and the love that you show people and the amount of commitment you have to showing care and compassion and it's just like man that's amazing and i just want to remind you that god sees you and, and rewards you for that because that's what it's all about it is it is all about the love i don't want to put down celebrities and like I don't know, there's a lot of celebrities that aren't that way because they pursued it, they just ended up that way. Um, how many of you have a celebrity? You're like, yeah, I know right away, like someone I admire for, you know, for their talent or something like that. And like, okay, like nothing necessarily wrong with that, but like, I don't know, like what if, what if that celebrity like walked through the back doors right now and came in here? Like what if like Taylor Swift just walked in? Like would that be distracting to you? Like, if I saw Lionel Messi come through the back doors, I might be like, oh, that's distracting, because, like, he's like, you know, I'm into soccer right now. And I think, like, wh why would they get more attention than God's word? Come on! Like, what is it about celebrities that like, draws our attention? Like, why are we doing this? And like I said, like, not putting them down. Like, I just, but there's nothing in celebrity culture that we're called as Jesus followers to pursue to admire or to want. Like, we are not called to that. We are called to, like, love people behind the scenes, like, out of the spotlight. Where there, there's no camera footage capturing what you're doing. There's nothing. It'll never make the social media feed anywhere. No one will know about it except for God and maybe that person, maybe that person that you're showing compassion to. And it's a hard calling. And, like, yeah, there's, it's just this dangerous celebrity culture, but listen, like, love is superior. Above all things, love is superior. Uh, Matthew 22, Jesus says, um, in response to this question, what's the greatest commandment? He says, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second the greatest commandment like, is love your neighbors yourself. You know, all the law and the prophets, everything in here is like summed up in that. I love that. What a simple message. Love is superior. 
And so if love is superior, we better learn what love is. So the second thing is that, uh, that Paul defines it. That's the next section that Paul gets, and he defines what love is, right? So he says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, love is patient, kind, doesn't envy, doesn't boast, is not proud, doesn't dishonor others, isn't self-seeking, is not easily angered, keeps no record of wrongs, doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth, protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres. And I wonder, is there one or two of those that stand out to you like, like a neon sign, you know, for whatever reason? Like, if that's the case, then, then write that down, like somewhere in your note section on your phone or on a paper or in your mind, just write it down if you have a good memory. Like, remember that because it's probably there for a reason. But we're going to go through these uh, one at a time. And so Paul, like uh, any good academic who's defining something, you want to define what it is, but you also want to define what it is not. And he does that here. And so he gives eight characteristics, first of all, of what love is not. So let's go through those one at a time. Uh, number one, love does not envy. And so the idea of envy here, and again, if I, I'm not putting all these on the screen, I'm going to go too fast for you to keep up if you're taking personal notes. So if you want my notes, just email me, john, J-O-N, hope to com. I will send you my notes. Love does not envy. So envy is like this intense negative feelings over another's achievements, success, or possessions. So we all struggle with it at times. Love does not envy. Uh, envy is a very powerful motivator. Uh, those of you who are in marketing or maybe those of you who are tuned in to commercials and advertisement, they, they make use of this tactic where they talk not about how this is going to benefit you, but they're talking about how this product's actually benefiting your neighbor. You know what I'm talking about? And so you think to yourself, oh, I don't have what my neighbor has. Their grass is going to be greener, so to speak, and you want that product. Look for it. You'll see it all over the place. Envy is a powerful a motivator. Love does not envy. I want to be clear here that there's a bit of a difference between envy and like a, a healthy jealousy. Uh, if you are married and your spouse uh, starts to check out another person and hang out with another person and show love to another person, you have the right uh, to be jealous. Do you know that? Because you are in a committed, covenantal marriage relationship where you've told each other you're mine and mine alone. God is described as a jealous God because he's in a covenant relationship with his people. Therefore, if his people start to worship idols and lift up other things, he is rightfully jealous. Do you understand? This healthy jealousy is different than envy. Envy is wanting possessions or wanting something that you don't have. It's, it's an unhealthy thing. And so love does not envy. Number two, love doesn't boast. Uh, the idea here is to, to heap praise on oneself, um, to behave as a braggart. A lot of these comments I'm giving are from different commentaries, again, that are in my notes. Not all my words. Uh, number three, uh, love is, is not proud, uh, closely related to boasting. It's the idea of like puffing yourself up. Um, that happens. That's not what love is. Um, I think this is a bit different than um, being proud of something that you do. There's kind of like a fine line there. Um, I think that's okay in some ways. Like, but I, I think the opposite of pride is not self-deprecation. Like, like we're not called to that as Christians to be like caning ourselves and like putting ourselves down. Do you understand? And so pride is this idea. What, what he's talking about here is, is this um, love doesn't puff oneself up. The idea is to avoid um, having an exaggerated self-conception or self-idea, uh, to think of oneself as more valuable or better than someone else. Um, yeah, okay, number, number four here. Love does not dishonor others. Pretty self-explanatory. Number five, a love is not self-seeking. Uh, number six, a love is not easily angered. Um, this list of descriptions, by the way, um, is a description of what God is like. Did you know that? The Bible says that God is love, and so when you read this, it's not just a list of how we should be loving towards other people. It's actually a description of what God is like. And what we have here, like, love is not easily angered. It reminds me of a verse from Psalm 145. The, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in love. Number seven, love keeps no record of wrongs. Um, if you have reached the stage of evidence collecting in your relationship with someone, it's time to talk to that person. Uh, keeping a record of wrongs um, is burdensome to the person who does it. 
it's not love. Number eight, the last one here, love does not delight in evil. And the idea here is love doesn't um, delight with un- injustice or unrighteousness. That's the eight things that love is not this. And then Paul says, like, positively, this is what love actually is. Uh, the first two descriptors in here, uh, love is patient and love is kind, are key. They're super important. That's why they're first on the list. Uh, so love is patient. And the idea here is to bear up um, underneath, like what the commentary says, provocation without complaint. And so um, this really is a characteristic, again, of what God is like. His, uh, what's called forbearance or overlooking the offense of sinners. And each one of us, if we've come to know Jesus, if we've come to know God in this way, we've come to accept his forgiveness, and we've come to realize that God is a merciful God who doesn't um, treat us like our sins deserve. And that's the idea here of overlooking an offense. Uh, love is patient. Ephesians 4.2 says, listen, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, uh, bearing with one another. That word patient is so key, and the idea of bearing up um, with one another is so important in the church. And, you know, it seems like such a low bar, like just bear with each other, doesn't it? But what happens when people don't bear with each other? That's when we get some big problems. Um, that word bear is actually used in a different scripture um, where it says, like, bear up under persecution. It's the same idea. How about that? So here's instruction one. If you're like physically harmed or verbally abused because of your faith, like bear up under that. Like just like persevere through it. The same word is used to like bear with other believers. I don't know. I find that kind of funny because there's conflict in the church, right? Like these people around us, like we see the world differently. And I said this before, like in the church, it just seems to be like so much more elevated, like because we're dealing with spiritual things and we're dealing with like eternal things and like, We've given each other power because we love each other, right? We're supposed to do that. And so when someone, like, just says the wrong thing or doesn't do what they, you think they should do and probably should do, and, like, they, you know, they, they miss out on the, I don't know, there's just so much potential for conflict, and it's Paul saying, like, listen, like, bear with one another out of love for each other, like God does with us. Uh, number two, love is kind. Um, It seems like such a simple word. But again, this is the characteristic of God for his loving kindness is great towards us. That loving kindness is one word. They're tied together. Uh, Reminds me of the verse in Titus. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. The kindness of God. It speaks towards... um, It's like the active side of the passive word, be patient. Like, don't just overlook offenses and bear with each other, but, like, take the next step and show kindness to people, even those that maybe don't treat you well, even to those that maybe you'd consider an enemy. Like, be kind to them. Uh, Number three, love rejoices with the truth. And again, this, um, the verse, the whole verse is don't don't delight in evil, but, but, but rejoice with the truth, right? Love doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And so it's like the, um, opposite of of delighting in evil and it's, so it's a contrast there and it's talking about like delighting when there's justice uh, when it takes place delighting when there's equality that takes place delighting when um, there's no bias based on age gender race or class it's that type of thing don't love doesn't delight in evil but it rejoices when there's this justice that takes place and my friends i just gotta remind us the church like I feel like I bang on this drum all the time, but like we are all like created in God's image and we are all equal under Christ, right? I just got to say it because sometimes it gets forgotten, but like we're brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless of how old you are or what your nationality is or what your education level is or what your gift is in the church, what your role is, like you are equal to the person beside you. And love sees that. It delights in that truth. Uh, love always protects. And again, the, the idea here isn't covering up things. The, this word is a bit, um, can be misleading if you misunderstand it. It doesn't mean to cover up. But what it means, again, is, is to bear all things. And you'll see that reflected in some of the translations. Love bears with one another. Number five, love always trusts. Again, this is not being naive. Like we just, oh, we just throw trust out to anybody, especially those who don't earn it or don't deserve it. No, we don't, that's not what it means. It's not about naivety. 
Uh, one commentator says, listen, it's about trusting the one God who calls us to love others and living out that love for others as a reflection of our trust in God. Number six, love always hopes. Again, not naively hoping, but uh, hoping, uh, maintaining the hope set before us by the one whom we have entrusted our lives and futures to, right? Uh, number seven, love always perseveres. It never gives up. It never quits. It never dies. It never comes to extinction. Uh, the kind of love here um, that's talked about is the Greek words agape, and I'm, I'm just saying that because some of you are going to be like, John, you didn't mention the word agape. <laughs> and some of you have seen that word out there, even if you're not like familiar with church language, like this word agape. Um, this is the type of love that, that God has. It's not a romantic love. It's not a love that's based on feelings, which we so often associate with what love is. Um, I talked to someone not part of this church, just in our community, that's falling out of love with his spouse. Oh, okay. That's not what he's talking about here. Love, this agape love, is, it's, a, it's an active word. Um, John Mayer wrote a song in 2012 called Love is a Verb. I think he stole the title from DC Talk. In 1992, they have a song called Love is a Verb, although it's spelled different, L-U-V. Um, in his book, Love Does, Bob Goff says, love one another. Uh, we don't need more instruction. We need more examples. Um, many of us are familiar with the passage of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. And so Jesus gives this parable as a, like, illustration to a question that the Pharisees ask, they say, well, who is my neighbor? Remember, Jesus had just said to him the greatest commandment or affirmed the greatest commandment is to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself, right? And so this Pharisee's like, well, who is my neighbor? Like, who am I supposed to love? And Jesus gives the example of the Good Samaritan. I won't go into the whole entire script today, but the Good Samaritan uh, acted on his love for this poor person who was in the ditch, beat up on the side of the road. Do you remember the parable? Remember the story? I looked at it and saw well, how many action words are actually in there. I counted eight. There's eight action words. This is what love does, according to Jesus. This is the person who loved their neighbor. It's the person who took action. And so these words are this. He, he saw him, he took pity on him, and here's the eight verbs. The good Samaritan went to him, bandaged him, poured oil and wine, put the man on his donkey, brought him to an inn, took care of him, took out money, and gave the money to the innkeeper. That's what love is. Love does. Uh, Jesus acted. He, he showed compassion to all people. Compassion. He's, he's moved from his bowels. It's kind of like a literal idea. Into action. Like compelled into action for those around him. That's what love is. Uh, we're familiar. We sang this song this morning. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave. Action word. His one and only son. That whoever believes in him. Will not perish but have everlasting life. Right? Um. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates an action word. God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Action word. So God demonstrates his love in actions towards us, and we demonstrate our love for God in actions to one another. This is the only way it works. So you here who have received the love of God, and you're like, I'm a believer, I'm a follower of Jesus now because of what God has done for me. I've received the love of God. Listen, the way we, we love God back is primarily through loving other people. In fact, it's impossible to love God if we don't love our fellow believers. Did you know that? So if we come here and we lift our hands up and we worship the Lord with our mouths, but then we go and we actually don't love our brother and sister in Christ, we're not actually worshiping God. We're not actually loving him. We're just giving him lip service. And so for any one of you today, if you want to express your love to God for what he has done for you, love your brother and sister in Christ. It's the best way to do it. Love is an action. Love is a verb. Love does. Love is a way. It's described by Paul. It's demonstrated by the actions of Jesus. And finally, love lasts. And this is the third thing that Paul talks about here, the future of love. So we get into this uh, last section here in verse 8. 
love never fails. But where there's prophecies, they're going to cease. They're going to stop. Where there's tongues, like people speaking in tongues, they're going to be stilled. Where there's knowledge, it'll pass away. Uh, so we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. And so all these gifts, um, speaking in tongues, uh, prophesying, even physical healings, uh, they're temporary. Uh, Lazarus, when he was raised from the dead by Jesus, Lazarus had to die again. It was a great miracle and demonstrated Jesus' power over death, right? But the guy has to die twice. Same thing with healings. Um, in Jesus' name, someone can be healed of something. That doesn't mean they're never going to get sick again. These are, these are temporary things, but there's a day coming where we will be completely healed. Like physically healed, given that new body. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. And like emotionally healed. When we get to heaven, it says that he will wipe away every tear. Praise the Lord for that. Total healing. Um, people prophesy today about the future that's coming. But one day, that future is going to be reality. And there's a no need for prophecies anymore. They're just going to be still. They're, they're done. Away with. Uh, people speak in tongues. They speak in this language that other people can understand sometimes. Foreign languages. Or they speak in this heavenly language. But there is a day coming where we will all understand each other. We will all speak this heavenly language. You ever wonder what language it's going to be? I don't know. I just had to throw that out there. My mind wanders sometimes. But all these things are temporary. There's a day coming. And as great as these things are and as useful as they are today, they're, they're just like appetizers. But there's, this, there's like a sit-down meal where like, it's just going to be so much better. You know, like, praise the Lord for giving us glimpses of what heaven's going to be like, but they're just glimpses. There's something better coming. And Paul says all these things, all these things are just temporary, but there is something that remains. There is something permanent. There is something that's going to last. And those three things are faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love, Paul says. This is the main thing. And so any act that you do out of love is going to be remembered. If you are filled with the love of Christ and you demonstrate that love to others through action, it will be remembered. It is like a, a permanent, like, recorded thing. And I think, man, that's what we should be, if anything else, be camping on. That's, as a church, that's what I want to be known for. I don't want to be known as a church for anything other than love. Like, I don't care if we have the best worship leader in town. Worship leading is important. I don't care, like, if, if I have the best reputation as a preacher, which I, I, don't, I don't pursue and don't want. That's not what matters. I don't care if we have the best programs for our kids or anything like that. Like, that's not what matters. It's this, this reputation of love that matters. My friends, if people come to this congregation from the community and they experience the love of God through you, they are going to come back. And that message will get out there, and that's what I want us to be known for. If you brag about Johnson Heights Church, brag about the people who love in this church. Talk about that. That's my hope. That's my dream, is that people come back here, and I hear stories of this because there are new people who encounter some of you, and I'm so grateful for it, and they come back because someone remembered your name or someone reached out and did some kind of act of compassion for you. Well, that's contagious. I remember back uh, a number of years ago when I used to be a youth pastor here, um, there were a lot of kids in our community. And like, I remember being so broken hearted over some of their family situations. Like, it's so rough out there. And like, my heart goes out to you still for anyone who comes from a family that's just not, they're trying, not, it's no criticism, but it's just, it's hard. And I remember, like, we had a youth team of people that would just, they would just show love to these high school students. They would just, like, do little things, like, like remembering their name or, like, hey, you want to 
grab a donut after school on Friday or something like that, like something like really small, <laughs> you know, like not like a huge thing. And like those kids just wanted to come back because someone cared for them. And like it's just so powerful. Um, so if love's so important, then, then how does it happen? Because loving is hard, right? Like it's this list of things, like we, we don't measure up, like we fall short. We're supposed to love like our fellow believers, like that fellow believer, you might be thinking. Yeah. So how, how in the world does this work? And like, just for sake of time, I'm gonna keep it pretty quick. Um, number one is simply to receive God's love. First uh, John 4.19 says, we love because he first loved us. We've got to receive it. We've got to receive the love of God. Um, I've talked about the sacrifice of Jesus, the cross for our sins, and that is an act of love from God for us. Is to receive that love is to know like today that you are loved like more than you could imagine, to like really believe that, the truth of God's word, not my word, God's word, you are, you are loved more than you can imagine. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done in your life, you are loved by God. And my friends, we need to, re- we need to be better at receiving that love. Um, when someone offers you an enormous gift, sometimes it's hard to take, but we gotta receive that gift. We gotta receive that love of God. It's a starting point. Nothing, don't go to anything else until you receive it. Like, why try and live out this Christian life that's marked by love if we haven't first received the love of God? Like, it is, it is step one. There it is. He loves you. He died for you. Receive it. Like, let it sink in. It's the most important thing. It's a starting point. Um, I was out about in the community this week this weekend and uh, like beautiful sunshine and like man like it seemed like everyone was happy on like Friday and Saturday you know what I mean like everywhere I went I went to Home Depot and everyone's smiling I'm like these people aren't normally this happy here you know they're happy to help me and asking all the questions can I help you get this or that they're super happy Um, I went to Circle K um, to get my kids a Slurpee after school on Friday and I was like okay and then I had um, anyways I forgot my phone in the van and so I got to the till and it's like oh no I don't have my phone on me to pay I don't have any cash let me run back to the van I'll see if I can find some cash and the person beside me or behind me is like I'll pay for your kids slurpees you know it's so nice right I'm like this sunshine is awesome man people are happy everywhere I was like I should have got three slurpees <laughs> um okay so I even went to the dump like the transfer station right with a load of like garbage from like our our yard we're cleaning up our yard a bit and the people at the dump were happy like, seriously, the person that, like, checking me in was, like, all smiles. I'm like, how's your day going? She's like, good. How about yours? I'm like, it's sunny. And we're super happy. And I can't help but think about it. Like, I didn't, I'm, okay, I don't think, like, I'm seriously depressive. And I know, like, some people are not making light of that. But, like, whenever it's sunny, I'm happy, right? And I know a lot of other people are happy, too, and it's sunny. And it's just been a long, like, wet spring, right? That's my point. So, um, if the sunshine can have that much of an effect on our mood, imagine if we soaked in the sunshine of God's love. Sorry, that sounds cheesy, but you get my point, right? Like, um, like, like receive the love of God. You know what I'm talking about? Um, it makes a difference. And I wonder sometimes for my life and for your life if we just are so busy and so distracted that we don't receive the love of God on a daily basis. How many of you woke up today and just like sat down and just like, took a deep breath and just like, thank you, God, for your love for me. (laughs) Yeah, some of you, yeah, hands up. That's awesome. I didn't. Like, I just got up this morning like, okay, I got to go preach. (laughs) (laughs) Like, why is it so hard to receive the love of God? Like, why don't we make a practice of it? It's so good, right? Like, I'm a sinner like you and like, God, I'm so sorry for, like, my sin. And, like, I'm just, like, confessing it to you now. Like, here it is. Like, I'm really sorry for that. And, like, God, I thank you for your love for me anyways. I thank you for your forgiveness and your compassion. One of my favorite verses in the book of Micah, it just says, um, God loves to show mercy. 
man, he loves you so much. And like, we just need to make a practice, my friends, myself included, of sitting down in God's presence and just receiving the love of God from him. Are you with me on this? Like, can we today, like, just take a moment, like, just to breathe and say, thank you, God, for your forgiveness, and thank you for your compassion. You know Paul's prayer for uh, the church? Read Ephesians three fourteen to 21. Paul's prayer for this church is that they would know the love of God. I think to myself as like a logical person, they already know the love of God. They've already received the gospel. Like they know this. Why is your prayer for them that they would know the love of God? And like it's something, it's not just like you receive it once and then you're on your way, I'm doing everything else. This is like a daily thing for us, maybe hourly for some of you, like to receive the love of God. Like Paul's prayer for this church who already knows about the love of God is that they would understand the love of God. And that that would transform their whole entire being. That they would be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. To the point where they're so full of the love of God that it just overflows the people around them. My friends, my best moments in my life are when I sit in God's presence and just receive his love for me. I receive his patience for me. I receive his forgiveness of my sin. I receive his mercy and I'm so full of that, that it just sort of spills over. So when the person cuts me over in, in, in traffic, I'm like, oh man, I'm so sorry. You must be having a hard day. Instead of like, you know what I mean? Like I want to rerun this guy. It's kind of like my driving is my barometer. The first thing, how does this happen? Is receive God's love. Number two is very simple. Give God's love. Um, I was going to do a a silly object lesson here to illustrate this. I was going to ask for someone to bring me a phone, a shoe, and a hat. And I was going to take that phone and shoe and a hat and give it to somebody else kind of as a joke. But that's sort of what it's like. Like, okay, receive these things from the Lord and then you, we got to actually give it away. That's how it works. If we don't give it away, whatever God's given to us, it's just sort of like, it's meant to be shared. It's meant to be given. And in the exercise of, exercise of giving love to others and to showing them compassion, uh, we actually come to understand God's love for us in greater ways. Do you understand? You ever given yourself, like emptied yourself for someone else to benefit them? For, not for any credit, not for any like thankfulness from them, and just you're, recipro- you're just giving to people what God has given to you. You ever done that before and got to the end of the day and be like, I'm so tired? And it's like God just says, like, John, I love you. A friend, I love you so much, and thank you for modeling that. Let me fill you up. Now you know what it's like for me to love you. You ever experienced that? No, not often enough for me, but this is how it works. This is, this is how it works. We receive the love of God and then we, li- we give the love of God. My friends, it, it's, it sounds simple, it's hard, but this is how it works. I'm gonna invite the worship team to come up right now and um, yeah, I'm just gonna pray into this really quickly and yeah, I just... Um, Yeah, let me pray. Lord, I want to thank you for uh, your love for us, that you poured yourself out. Um, God, that you made a way for us to not just know about the depth of your love for us, but to experience your love. Um, well, I know in your word it says that you have poured out your love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. God, I don't know the mechanics of it or how it works, Lord, but I know it's a reality in my life at different times, and it is, has been for many people in this room, Lord. And I just, I really do sense, God, I know this, that there's people listening today who need to experience the outpouring of your love into their hearts. Lord, maybe they've forgotten how loved they are, or maybe they've never experienced it before. God, it's more than just theory. It's more than just talk. It's, it's like an actual, like, indwelling of your spirit in our hearts. And I just... God, I want to come to you with open hands today, myself, and I pray, um, you know, if there's anyone else here in this room or listening today, God, that, Lord, we would have open hands and we would just say, come fill our hearts with your love. God, there's so many things that tear us down. There's so many voices that accuse us of being unworthy, of being wrong, and just being sinners and dirty and all these things, Lord, and you just come and you come right into the mess of our lives and you just pour out your love for us. You forgive us, you, you wash us, you, 
you just, it's all you, it's all your mercy, it's all your grace, it's all your forgiveness, it's all your compassion, and you just pour it out into our hearts. And so, Lord, would you pour out your love into many people's hearts through your Holy Spirit, even now as we pray. Lord, I ask that you wouldn't move us quickly from this moment, but that, that we would carry this um, through today, through this week, through the rest of our lives. God, and I pray that you would um, fill us so much, Lord, that our actions would just simply be an overflow of your love for us. Maybe as simple as that. Lord, just fill us to overflowing. And Lord, we pray for this community and for the many communities that we live in. God, would you, man, would you draw people, would you draw people to yourself? Um, and would you use us, Lord, as a community that is so compassionate towards each other that they would see what you are like in us? Lord, I just, I thank you, God, that we're on a journey together and, um, that we, we're not, you don't call us to, like, to be perfect, God, but you call us to grow and to, to learn and to walk with you in this. And I, I pray, God, that this church, um, thank you for the many people already here that love, but God, I pray that you'd increase that love to the point that this would be the primary reputation that we have in our communities. That's a place of love. And Lord, I pray that that would draw people in. So God, we lay all this at your feet. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your love and compassion and we pray for your help in these things. In Jesus' name, amen.